Abaragani, and Hotep. My name is Dr. Clyde Robertson. I'm an associate professor and director for the Center for African and African American Studies at Southern University at New Orleans. Welcome to our African American History Month program, I Can't Breathe, a discussion about race, racism, and lasting change in New Orleans and throughout Louisiana. In October 2020, I Can't Breathe Part One defined racism and disconscious racism, explored racism in Louisiana's criminal justice system, discussed the over-policing of black bodies and the under-policing of black communities. It examined the unique experiences of Shreveport's African-American population. Today's panel will address the following issues. How race and zip codes determine a person's health in Louisiana. How race and racism led to the takeover of the New Orleans public school system. How race-based discriminatory policies and practices in New Orleans and Louisiana's housing codes continue to adversely impact upon African Americans in New Orleans and throughout the state. And finally, we will ask the all-important question, what could and should African Americans do to hold our elected officials accountable? As you listen to our valued panelists, you'll see that they have internalized the following quote from the honored ancestor and human and civil rights stalwart, Fannie Lou Hamer. If you don't speak out for yourself, <laughs> Sister <laughs> Hamer once said, nobody is going to speak out for you. These pundits continue to speak out, not only for themselves, but for others as well. The discussants will be introduced to you by Mr. Oliver O.T. Thomas. Brother O.T. is a former elected official who is currently a political advisor and consultant, a community organizer and activist, and one of the most popular and effective radio talk show hosts in New Orleans. O.T. hosts the Good Morning Show with Oliver Thomas on Black-owned radio, WBOK. At this moment, please allow me to once again invoke the bravery and brilliance of Fannie Lou Hamer, who once said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. These words motivate people all over the world, confront bigotry and racism. And it also motivates people like our host, the dynamic, Brother Oliver O.T. Thomas. First, let me thank, uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank the uh, Southern University family, uh, the Center for African and African American Studies, uh, Dr. Clyde Robinson, our panel participants, as well as the, those who participated in the first panel. Uh, but also, I'd like to encourage everyone to share uh, the Zoom with as many people as possible uh, while you're tuning in and while you're listening, so that everybody can be part of what I think will be one of the most profound discussions uh, on race, racism, and lasting change uh, here in Louisiana. We have a great and esteemed panel uh, to present and to participate in this discussion, Dr. Robertson, uh, none other than Dr. Keith uh, Ferdinand. We have Dr. Renard Sanders. We have Ms. Angelica Morris and a noted uh, political scientist and Professor George Amity. Uh, we are going to start with uh, Dr. Kurt, Dr., uh, Dr. Keith Ferdinand. Dr. Ferdinand received his medical, de medical degree from Howard University uh, College of Medicine in Washington, D.C. He is a board certified internal medicine and cardiovascular disease. He is certified uh, uh, sub subspecifically of nuclear cardiology and a specialist in clinical hypertension. 
He is a member of the Association for University Cardiologists and past chair of the National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention. Dr. Ferdinand also is a, uh, excels in preventive cardiology. He has conducted numerous trials in hypertension, hypertension lipids, cardiometabolic risk, and cardiovascular disease, especially as it relates to racial and ethnic minorities, with over 200 uh, peer-reviewed publications and lectures nationally and internationally. He has won awards, the Congressional Black Caucus of Health and Trust for Journalism, the Charles Drew Award for the National Minority Equality Foundation, the Wingo Award for Medical Leadership by the Women of Heart, and the ABC Spirit of Heart for Distinguished Leadership Award, and in the 2019 Xavier University Champion Award for Health and Equity, and the AHA 2019 James P. Herrick Award for Outstanding Achievement in Clinical Cardiology. Guys, join me in welcoming uh, our homeboy, none other than the Lower Nine in the city of New Orleans, Dr. Keith Ferdinand. Thank you very much, Oliver, for such a gracious introduction. I'm going to speak only for about five minutes, but what I have to say I think is very impactful. If you can show the slides and we'll click through them quite briskly so that we can let our other panelists give their presentations and we'll have time to talk. So let's look at the slides. I'm going to show the relationship between race and zip code, how it determines a person's health. Next slide. We know African Americans are a high risk person. Uh, here's a guy grabbing his chest. He's having a heart attack. Next slide. But if you look at life expectancy itself, the lowest life expectancy of all the major groups of black males, and this has been going on for decades in terms of the amount of life that can be expected from birth. Next slide. And when you look at, next slide, black females, their life expectancy is also diminished, especially when compared to white females. Next slide. Now, why is this? Well, there are some genetics that may play a part but this is called a Venn diagram and the size of the biggest circle that affects disease and outcomes is environment, diet, lifestyle, socioeconomic status, and other exposures. And self-identified race is really a proxy for that combination of biology and the social determinants of health. Next slide. Next slide. This is an interesting study. It's a little old, but it's important. The guy who's the first author, Dr. Christopher Murray, is the same person who gives projections on COVID-19. You see him on television. But he did a study several years ago describing what he called eight Americans. Next slide. And when he cut America into different pots based on where you live, race, ethnicity, the shortest life expectancy for blacks lived in poor urban areas with a 14 year difference between the highest life expectancy and the lowest life expectancy. Next slide. Next slide. Here in Louisiana, it's a wonderful state, but we know when we look at health rankings, there's often a jostle between Louisiana and Mississippi, not for who's the best, but who's the worst. And one of the last ways in which this was configured, we actually ranked number 50. Next slide. It's no mystery. This is a map of the slave trade from the 1800s. New Orleans was the largest slave market. And you can see throughout the Southeast area, those maps that show how the slaves migrated. Next slide. With New Orleans being the hub. Next slide. To a large extent, mirrors the same type of maps where the dark red are the areas where you have the highest hospitalization, from heart disease and strokes, and the highest mortality or death from heart disease and strokes. Next slide. We know that where you live has a profound impact on whether you can live or die. Next slide. And this was not only with Katrina, but as a child, I lived through Hurricane Betsy and suffered some of the same indignities that were seen with Katrina. Next slide. Now there's a clear relationship in the newest condition that's affected our people, COVID-19. It's called social vulnerability. It's a combination of housing, minority status, economic income, and the ability to survive COVID-19. Next slide. In this recent publication, looking at Louisiana census tracts, 
with New Orleans at the bottom, next slide, the darker areas are the areas where you have the most COVID-19 in dark red or maroon, next slide, and the green areas are areas where you have the highest amount of social vulnerability, next slide. And you can see that there's a cluster in the central city area, next slide, and another cluster around the industrial canal area, next slide. Unfortunately, this is not just a concept that should be found in textbooks. It actually has affected our life and living itself. This is a headline directly quoted from the USA Today. United States lost a whole year of life expectancy and for black people, it's nearly three times worse. Their words, not mine. Next slide. It's based on a study that looked at life expectancy. Next slide. Black life expectancy is at the bottom compared to white ex life expectancy. Next slide. You can see the white black death gap, which has been persistent for decades. Next slide. It actually narrowed somewhat around 2015. Next slide. But with the downward trend with COVID-19 life expectancy, the white black death gap has now increased. Next slide. So I think we've had provocative information that life living and life itself is affected where you live, race, ethnicity, social class, social determinants of health. And we can talk about this more going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Keith uh, Ferdinand. And we'll hear more in our question and answer in our free flowing discussion with our panelists. Uh, I Can't Breathe, a discussion about race, racism, and lasting change in Louisiana, a virtual panel, part two. Our next uh, presenter is no stranger to national discussions about race, racism, equity, uh, and education. Uh, Renard Sanders uh, has extensive experience in teaching, uh, in, edu in educational administration, and economic and community development. As a principal of New Orleans High School, he developed the first high school DNA lab in the state of Louisiana and created the Creole Cottage Project, an innovative workforce development program where his students built and renovated houses in the school's community. Dr. Sanders also served as executive director of the National Faculty of New Orleans, a professional development agency designed to improve the quality of teaching in poor performing schools throughout the Mississippi Delta. He was a director of the Urban Education Graduate Program at Southern University in New Orleans. He serves as consultant to several agencies, including uh, Mississippi NAACP, the Southern Initiative Algebra Project, Total Community Action, and Dr. Sanders has conducted numerous seminars and workshops throughout this country. He hosts a weekly radio show on public education in New Orleans and has recently authored two books, 21st Century Jim Crow Schools, The Impact of Charter Schools in Public educa in Education, and The Coup d'etat of New Orleans Public Schools, School District, Money Power, and the Illegal Takeover of the Public School System. Dr. Sanders has received his BA from Dillard University, his Master of Education from Southern University in Baton Rouge, and his Doctorate of Education from Teachers College at Columbia University in New York, Dr. Renard Sanders. You guys hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver, for that introduction. And I also would like to thank Southern University at New Orleans and the Center for African American Studies for this panel, um, this wonderful panel, and to talk about issues that are so important to the survival of African Americans. The particular topic I'm going to talk about is how race led to the takeover of the public schools. But before we begin that, we need to put some things in this proper context. And that is, is that the privatization of public schools in New Orleans and the removal of the public from the public education process didn't just haphazardly happen after Hurricane Katrina. In many ways, it is a continuation of age-old efforts to deny African-American citizenships by keeping them in a social, economic, and political subservient position akin to the conditions in slavery. To put this whole discussion in the context of race, we need to understand that race is the determining factor 
on whether or not you have citizens' rights or not. Whether you are denied rights is all determined by race here in America. It is huge. It is a human event, event in short term use to characterize people according to skin color, genetics, but it is, doesn't have any biological concepts. It is a real social construction that denies or gives benefits and privileges. It is also a political construction, race is, and it is created for political purposes. The classification of human beings with the, with the purpose of giving power to white people to legitimize the dominance of white people over non-white people. So race basically in America determines either the opportunity or the lack of opportunity to participate socially, economically, and politically in America. In Louisiana, like many other states, just to give you a little bit more historical perspective, in 1830, uh, Louisiana passed a law making it illegal to teach a slave how to read and write. And the reasoning behind that was that if we taught them how to read and write, then they would learn to resist. And resistance was something that they definitely did not want, given our importance to this economy that made cotton king and the free labor that we provided. So we did not receive any formal government public education until right after the Civil War and also into Reconstruction, even though government uh, was paying for educational services to white children, for black children, as we well know, it was not afforded to us. At the end of Reconstruction, um, when we had a large number of integrated schools and schools and government funds being used to educate black children, white youths, um, as the, the troops left the South, white youths broke into the integrated public schools and literally dragged back children from the schools, destroyed property and assaulted children. We, un we do need to understand that there are two sacred cows as it relates to citizens' rights uh, in America. One is the right to vote, and the other one is the right to public education. So we have seen throughout history, not just in Louisiana, across the country, that denial either to not offer public education and or offer inadequate services. So as we look at New Orleans, New Orleans has a very long history of doing that. And I wanna talk about a couple of things just to, just to bring it in the proper context post Katrina. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were removed from those schools. We were given limited uh, educational services, um, not really cared about. And for the most part, it was always thought that black children could not learn beyond the fifth grade. So as the African-American community solicited the school board to open up the first black public high school in Louisiana, the big question on the school board was, um, why would, should we offer them chemistry and algebra? And so that prolonged that whole fight and they finally relented and they opened up, we opened up the first black public high school in New Orleans at the resistance from the board in 1917. And then when you move further along and most of us know about Craig School, which is in the Treme, um, that was a new school that we, they were building and the board had real problems with building any new schools for any black kids. And so we had a board member at that time named James Forshe, and he resisted the building of the, the giving it at school to black children. And he stated on the record that he thought it was a threat to white supremacy for black children to walk in front of white people's house to go to school. Now I do need to remind you that we're talking about the Treme, the oldest African-American community in the country. But this kind of thinking from Forche, who went on to state that he would even use violence to protect um, white supremacy, has been a pattern that has existed in New Orleans, particularly as it relates to providing public education since we began here in 1718. 
And even when you look at the building of Booker T. Washington, which was a big issue because it was going to be an African-American school, they held that up because they didn't want to train the African-American students in the same vocational vocations where they would compete with white students. So I want to point that out because I want to lay out this whole history of um, this effort, this concerted effort to deny or either offer inadequate services. As the school district became predominantly black and we got black leadership, we began to see a, um, the, the mainstream media and the business community to stop supporting public education such that they would not pass any millages. And then we come to this all out attack and criticisms of the New Orleans Public School District pre-Katrina. Um, when Katrina came, it became a once in a lifetime moment for them to move and to take over the New Orleans Public School District away from the black dominated board and also from black leadership. Um, within weeks after Hurricane Katrina, they changed the takeover policy for taking over school districts and um, raised a standard and wrote uh, some legislation called Act 35 and illegally took over 107 schools. They raised the score, which was 60 as the cutoff to 87.4. So with that, we had a number of schools that had recently gotten accolades from the public, from the Louisiana Department of Education for their academic performance were suddenly called failing schools. In these 107 building, in these 107 schools, they took over empty buildings, they took over empty lots, and they essentially ended local participation as governance for the recovery school district, moved to Baton Rouge, where meetings were held mostly on Tuesday and Wednesday at 10 p.m. The other thing that really hurt us was the dismissal of 7,500 school employees, mostly African-American, that devastated the black community. Our children will never recover from that. And as a result of that, uh, post-Katrina, the recovery school district, and even those schools, those charter schools that operate now under Orleans Parish, perform worse academically than any other school district in the state of Louisiana. So despite all of the claims by a very powerful PR campaign financed by people who are very interested in this country of privatizing public education, this has been an academic nightmare. It has been an unprecedented fiscal mismanagement. And what it also has done, it has reinforced a tiered system of public education where public education are offered to services to kids based on race and class. Um, so if you are in one school, you may get a quality education, but it's highly likely that you, the large African-American population are not in those seven or eight schools and are getting uh, poor quality education and are performing very, very poorly. Um, after, do, after control in the recovery school district for 13 years, they codified this system into law, turned it back over to the Orleans Parish School Board, and neutered the board such that the charter school operators have unquestionable autonomy. And the school board is the only, the New Orleans Public School Board is the only school board in the state of Louisiana that does not have control of the daily operations of its schools. And we are the only parish that exists like that. So under the guise of school reform, um, we have circumvented the Brown decision uh, because we have some schools which are mostly white and a majority African-American community. We have um, basically gone back to the flawed separate but equal policy that was implemented after Plessy versus Ferguson. So it, this is only because we are an African-American school district and we have a, and the, the opportunity to seize it after Katrina was like once in a generation. So we have a publicly funded yet private school district that is funded by a small group of 
white people who control all of the resources and determine which, which kids go to which schools. Thank you. This concludes my initial presentation. We want to thank Dr. Uh, Renard Sanders. And I can't wait until the uh, question and answer and some of the free-flowing conversation uh, from our listeners, uh, especially about race, equity, and education. Our next uh, panelist and presenter uh, for this uh, part two discussion uh, is Ms. Andronika Morris. Uh, I like to call her one of the foremost authorities on affordable housing uh, in this country. She is the executive director uh, for Housing NOLA, a 10-year partnership between the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance and the Foundation for Louisiana, the city's Office of Housing and Community Development, and dozens of public, private, and nonprofit organizations working to solve affordable housing. Prior to her, her role as executive director, she spearheaded the Housing NOLA 10-year strategy that we talked about on uh, the Good Morning Show and many others. The strategy indicates the need, Dr. Robinson, for over 36, 33,600 additional affordable housing units by 2025. As a graduate of, no of Loyola, Ms. Morris has worked to create affordable housing opportunities for the greater New Orleans area for both public and the private sector. Ms. Morris has assisted in creating opportunities for approximately 500 families to become first-time home buyers after Hurricane Katrina, and she was the lead organizer for GNOHA when it started in 2007 as a collaborative coalition for nonprofit housing builders and community development corporations who work to rebuild this city. She has established many connections throughout this community. Uh, she is known as one of the leading voices in this state, in this region on affordable housing. Ms. Sandra Nico Mars. Thank you so much, OT. Welcome. And thank you all so much for having me this morning. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a little tickle in my throat because of the weather change. Uh, as uh, Oliver said, I'm Andrea Kamaras, Executive Director of Housing NOLA. I'm going to get through this really quickly because we only have about five minutes. But I'm here to talk about how race-based discriminatory housing practices and policies continue to adversely affect the people of New Orleans as well as Louisiana. Uh, here is a, sign, a, a picture from our last Put Housing First March we, uh, this kind of encapsulates two of our positions. The rent is too damn high and we need to put housing first. Why is that and so, why is that so important? We know and can prove and can demonstrate that housing is central to opportunity. Stable and, stable and affordable housing is the cornerstone of household financial security and resilience. We cannot, we cannot address other issues like criminal justice reform, like education reform, economic reform, civic engagement. We cannot address those issues without dealing with housing. And it is our failure to deal with housing in this country that has stymied so much of the initiatives that are needed for social justice and particularly are necessary for affordable housing. Um, you can see this juxtaposed here in, in Louisiana, a, a tale of two cities was happening, happening in Lake Charles and in New Orleans as they are struggling right now with dealing with the, the repercussions of natural disasters. But look at how much money it takes to live in a place like Lake Charles compared to New Orleans. While that there's a big difference between those numbers, when you think about how a, a place like Lake Charles that is a third of the size of New Orleans, but still someone needing 16 to make $16 an hour to rent an apartment, a two bedroom apartment in New Orleans and needing to make $20 an hour um, to rent in New Orleans. And while we're battling over increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which isn't enough for you to live in St. for Lake Charles or New Orleans. And a lot of our policies don't consider these kinds of metrics when we're thinking about them. How much does it take to actually live in your community? Those communities have also been interrupted in this, and, 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 and um, displaced, waste-based displacement because of natural disasters like Hurricane Laura last year that devastated Lake Charles. And again, there has still not been a comprehensive, substantial response to Hurricane Laura. Governor John Bell Edwards only recently asked President Biden for a disaster declaration or the beginning of a disaster package for Lake Charles, asking for $2 billion. Just as a reminder to everyone, Hurricane Laura hit in August of last year. 
So why hasn't, why didn't the Louisiana delegation, why didn't the, the governor ask the previous administration for the funding necessary to move forward? And where have the people of Lake Charles been this entire time? They have been moving from hotel rooms to hotel rooms as funding has run out and we have not put housing first. We have not looked to stabilize them. This is eerily similar, unfortunately, to what happened to Hurricane Katrina and how New Orleans was similarly de de uh, de devastated and how we still, almost 16 years later, have not managed to bring back over 100,000, almost 100,000, mostly African Americans. A grim statistic was released uh, yesterday showing the, the states, or the, sorry, the cities that have had the uh, most increases in population and the least. New Orleans is uh, almost bottom of the list. We have still, we're still in the last 20 years, we've lost over 93,000 people. And we have not been able, we've not continued to grow and to, to expand our population. This has devastating effects on things like our COVID response because we can't get direct funding, uh, we can't get direct assistance, and you see people are incredibly housing insecure. Look at what's happening with people being late paying their mortgages, people being late paying their rent, and how this is drastically different in the African American communities and black and brown communities in general. And our failure to respond, the fact that we have not, we did not see a substantial COVID package for housing until December of last year should be something that all of us are constantly nagging our elected officials and policymakers about, but we're not. So why don't we think about that? Because we believe, we don't think that housing is a human right. We don't think that it's something that should be guaranteed. Oops. Instead, it's something that we think should be, um, that, that, that people, we allow the racialized aspects that, that people um, attribute to housing to infect all our decision making. The welfare queen stereotype is the knee jerk reaction that people have when they hear affordable housing, subsidized housing, guaranteeing housing. They think of a poor black woman with too many children and even African Americans uh, decry and excoriate that stereotype to the point where we are frankly shooting ourselves in the foot and costing ourselves the resources that we need. We are working on this with our housing triad. We have very specific policy recommendations on how to address COVID and use the COVID resources to stabilize everyone and guarantee housing for all so that we can move forward as we move out of this crisis to a just an equal society. Um, in short, we believe that our communities can and must provide safe and accessible housing that are affordable at all levels at, throughout in New Orleans and throughout Louisiana. We cannot win if we don't change um, our, our, our mindset. And if African Americans do not recognize the part that we have been playing in marginalizing housing and how we are doing it using race against ourselves and our own people. Uh, thank you all so much for having me. I'm going to be here for the rest of the panel, and I look forward to the, continuing this conversation. Thank you, Ms. Morris, and uh, we appreciate your, your steadfast fight uh, for fairness and affordable housing. Whenever I talk about Angelica Morris, Dr. Robson, I said, we, you know, Matthew 25, 35, and 36 is one of the great scriptures. You know, stranger, uh, hungry, you fed me, thirsty, you gave me a drink. Uh, uh, you know, you had a home, you brought me in. And so Andronica continues to, to remind Dr. Amity, uh, our political leaders, that uh, it's, it's more than just an oath to the state constitution or the city charter. Uh, it's about an oath to our faith. Uh, our next presenter is probably uh, one of the foremost political scientists and authorities uh, in this region. Uh, you can see him on television and radio. He hosts a uh, co-host with Dr. Clark, a monthly segment uh, with the professor and I, on, on WBOK, and uh, I always say he gives his politics uh, with a twist, uh, the world according to Dr. Amity and the world according to the facts. Uh, Dr. Amity is currently a professor of political science at Southern University of New Orleans. He has a bachelor's degree from Louisiana State University, political science, a master's degree uh, in urban and regional planning from Virginia Tech, and a PhD in political science from Northern uh, Illinois uh, in a University. He has uh, 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 other positions uh, that are previously held by Dr. Amity include uh, the chairman of New Orleans Regional Planning Commission and a member of the New Orleans Recreation 
uh, Commission. His governmental professional experiences uh, include Transportation and Environmental Planner for the City of New Orleans Commission, Senior Planner for the Mayor's Office of Transit and uh, in the, in the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority. He is a founding member of the uh, Emoji Institute on Culture, Trade, and Economic Development. He has also held a number of positions as Research Associate, Instructor with the Transportation Institute of North Carolina a and uh, University and Director of Urban Studies at SUNO. He has published articles in public policy and entrepreneurial policy in, in the Journal of Education, the Journal of Race, Gender, and Class. Uh, guys, world renowned, Dr. Amadi. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, I want to thank the Center for African and African American Studies for inviting me to present on this illustrious panel with all of these uh, very uh, uh, scholars and in very areas. Uh, and so what I'm going to try to do is uh, talk about the political aspects, uh, the way O.T. couched it as though politics is the answer to everything. And after listening to Dr. Sanders' presentation, he almost convinced me that was true. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and put my uh, uh, PowerPoint up. Okay, once again, uh, the historical and contemporary racism, and so we're in search of change and accountability. Next slide. So I, wa I want to start from uh, post-Civil War. We know the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Uh, after those things passed, African Americans kind of enjoyed a period where they were allowed to vote, actively participate in the political process, and some of the even had some uh, ownership rights, employment rights, and, and public accommodations wasn't what we thought it was. But then the opponents rallied against that. Move on. Next slide. So, uh, so a period of Louisiana African American voter suppression began. Of course, the famous Mechanic Institute uh, attack and riots where the ma the mob attack. Uh, a, a constitutional convention to extend the voting uh, and, and political rights of blacks and 38 people died, 150 were injured. And then between 1866, 1877, another 388 people were assassinated specifically for the purpose of suppressing voter suppression. It was the uh, 1898 Louisiana State Convention had passed laws that systematically excluded African Americans from the electoral process, also included the 3 9 anonymous jury. Uh, the grandfather clause was put into to place, which uh, in some sense, if, you had, if your grandfather hadn't voted or after a certain date, and of course, most African Americans were enslaved, so they had not voted, so they were not extended the right to vote. And it also, if, if your grandfather voted before January 1st, 1867, it permitted those uh, whites who ran for the vote to do it without taking any kind of test. Although it was uh, outlawed in 1916, even after that point, a special form was developed for voting that had questions like, did you have any convictions? Of course, this was in the period where we had the peonage system where blacks were being rounded up and thrown into prison. So you had a record, you couldn't vote. Uh, con are, are you living in the common law? Are you common law? You, you, you couldn't vote. Uh, do you have, Ill, quote unquote, Ill, so-called illegitimate children? So we see the, the pattern here. Next slide. So really, actually, the 1896 election of black blacks votes were counted. Uh, it was a, a kind of between the farm whites and the more wealthy whites. But after the, so the, the blacks, the, the wealthy whites kind of uh, won that election. And consequently, the, the more rural whites and farm whites say, look, we have to push for total disenfranchise. Thus, the 1898 convention. And then the more significant, the primary act of 1906, where the Democrats pushed for a white primary. So to qualify to vote, you have to be white. Because there was a Republican Party at that time. But the Republican Party was split between what was called the Black and Tan Party, those who favor 
rights for blacks, and then the Lily White Party, those who uh, were white supremacists, and so they couldn't poll enough, enough votes to hold a primary, so all you had basically after 1906 was the so-called white primary. So few blacks Republicans did benefit uh, we had in this, in this city and supported re the Republicans, uh, especially at the national level when they won and certain patronage jobs would be given to blacks in the South. Walter L. Coyne is an example. He headed the Custom House. He also employed at, at, in the Custom House Alexander Pierre Turo, which was interesting. Little or no significant black voting until Smith versus Allwright, uh, which eliminated the white primary in 1946. And of course, I have to point to the fact that at that time, after 46, my father, the late attorney Earl Giamatti, went out there and ran for office when no one uh, believed that uh, voting would lead to any consequence. So he had, and you were, there were some black elected from black towns and stuff, but in terms of major uh, elections, people saying, what's happened? What is this guy running for office for, you know, in 1950? Next slide. So we, it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act, although there were some activities uh, pre Voting Rights Act, the significant uh, growth in black elected officials and the importance of black elected officials occur after the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as amended. Uh, of course, that brought on party politics increasingly polarized, as we say, see today. Uh, race was the most significant factor in the urban local elections. And I put, I, you know, I couldn't put all of the black elected officials that came in 1965, but I did put, I decided to put on my slide the Honorable uh, Dorothy May Taylor, uh, because she's representative of the kind of leadership that came into place as a result of that 1965 Voting Rights Act. There were many others. Uh, so, and so the number of black elected officials, uh, you know, increased enormously, you know, you know, at, at least, by 2010, one estimate there was over 10,000 elected black elected officials in the United States. Next slide. But of course, we have new forms of voter suppression that also coincides with that. And the most uh, significant one in recent years was the Shelby versus Holden 2013 Supreme Court decision, which gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And that was very important because uh, the, the federal government, particularly when there were Democrats elected, could go in and monitor what was going on in those uh, white supremacists or conformer Confederate states. And so pre-clearance was uh, uh, required to do basic things. So we see as a result of that being gutted, there's no more uh, federal watchdog over uh, activities in the former Confederate states. So we have things like slow down mail and, uh, you know, and of course now with the Supreme Court appointments or stop counting people of color. And then one of the things I'm going to highlight in my presentation is redistricting, gerrymandering and other voter suppression. So I list a whole group of them, reducing the closing polling, polling places, voter ID laws, voter purges. You see them right there. Uh, you know, the private elected officials of resources, extradition, tra extra distant travel to the poor places, so on, de 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 enfranchising because of, you know, convicted felons, complicated forms. This last election, I got a copy of the absentee form, and I'll tell you, I couldn't hardly understand what the hell they were asking me at that particular time, misinformation, so forth, so on. So you have some old tactics and new tactics coming into play for voter suppression. Next slide. Let's look at some of the effects, particularly of uh, redistricting and gerrymandering. Uh, so let's look at, in terms of the population, uh, we have whites of 56%, African Americans 32%, Hispanics 6%, Asians 3%, Native Americans 3%, and Louisiana. In terms of US senators, 0%. In terms of uh, House members or congressmen, 17%, well under the 32%. States, uh, well, that should be state senate, 23%. State representatives, 23%. All below the, the threshold of 32%. Uh, 
uh, which is about a third. Actually, we had two Congress people at one time. We had Cleo Fields and William Jefferson. And of course, when uh, we lost population, they got rid of one of the black districts. And then same thing with the Board of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education. Judges, 78% white, 22% African Americans. The most significant judgeships, district and juvenile court, you know, criminal court, uh, you know, 86% of the judges are white, 14% of the judges are African American, and this directly relates to political power and because of course incarceration also has an impact on voting. Next slide. And so I'll give you some statistics, you know, of course African Americans with fel felony convictions nationwide, about 2 million, but if you look at you know how much larger New York is, the state of New York to Louisiana, and these are, there are 25,524 African Americans with uh, felony convictions in Louisiana, which is significantly less than you have almost the same amount. So it has an impact on who votes. Next slide. Some other rankings, uh, top state imprisonment ranking, that is percent of African Americans serving life without parole. And although the numbers are not, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, Florida has a larger number, but in terms of the percentage of that number that's African American from 2013 to 2019, you see Louisiana uh, has the highest percentage. Uh, except for one year, Oklahoma had the uh, high percentage. Next slide. So also in terms of those who serve in life for juvenile, uh, juvenile life, 79% African-Americans, 21% whites and others. Next slide. Well, let's look at an example of gerrymandering. Let's look at the judgeship. Of course, every, uh, you're supposed to have district judgeships. Well, uh, 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 Helena Parish, which is, you know, significantly African-American, well, they decided to merge their district, it's supposed to be district, right, judgeship with Livingston Parish, which is majority uh, white. And so consequently, that was a tactic that's used, a gerrymandered tactic used to reduce the potential of black judges. Uh, I'm also talking about the black vote in Jefferson Parish gerrymandered in the congressional districts and just overall at large versus district election. Next slide. So here we see Louisiana. Now, everyone knows if you if you draw district lines east to west, you in Louisiana, you can't help but get two black districts. But when you have those elongated north to south and you combine Baton Rouge with New Orleans, then you're ultimately saying, I just want one black congressperson. Next slide. Next slide. Hello. Uh, that's it. That's the uh, last slide. No, no, that, that, no. There you go. All right. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, Jefferson Parish Council Districts. If you see Jefferson Parish Council District, uh, the the uh, the black person on the council represents District Three. Wow. Look how that's configured. They had uh, tied in the the blacks on the east bank with the blacks on the west bank to make sure that Jefferson Parish only has one district uh, and that the other districts will be white. Next slide. So holding black elected officials accountable. These are some uh, ideas that I've come up with. Uh, when we talk about rhinos, we also have dinos. Democrats in name only. They follow the money and they, they're supported by Republican money. And so they perpetuate a Republican agenda. Uh, they d do not have a progressive black agenda. And you know, I know you got to get your money from ev everywhere, but he who paid the piper gets to call the tune. Secondly, transparency. Uh, you know, and this is where I put on the onus of the, of the voters because, you know, the, the way to hold elected official accountable is to hold them accountable before they come into office. And so, you know, we have to begin to assess how did they vote? What is their track record before being elected? Besides having masters and PhDs and the like. Uh, thirdly, 
the Democratic State Party supports. Our so-called Democratic Party, you know, oftentimes do not support Democratic candidates, even when they're in the the uh, race with <laughs> with only Afri- with uh, only Democrats. Uh, you know, and then we have Democratic leaders who are going around and escorting some of these Republicans who supported purges, who supported, uh, you know, uh, uh, suits against helping black folk, the national suits. And we've had, we got some of our elected officials who escort them to black churches and do it like, my God, who, I mean, what's happening here? Uh, And then there should be positive public policy, ensure black community and businesses Individuals get their fair share, federal funding, contracts, jobs, investments in the community responsible for holding their white counterparts accountable. Uh, then the New Orleans Council Council is responsible for should be responsible for election administration. We gave that up after Katrina. It galls me to see uh, the Secretary of State uh, in in those uh, polling places running uh, New Orleans election. We need to take back, our council need to take back the administration responsibility for our elections. Some of those people cannot be trusted. Uh, So, and we need to have polling places on HBCU campuses. We have one on Ben Franklin, which is at, you know, UNO, that Bill Franklin Hospital. Why can't Suno have one? Why can't Dillard have one? Uh, Support uh, strong black candidates. We need to develop black leadership training in a think tank to support righteous candidates. Next slide. And of course, I like this uh, proposed this thing that's happening in Harris County, Texas, where all election day polling locations are open to all eligible voters in Harris County. So. You know, one of the things is manipulating where people vote or, you know, making sure you go to, hey, you you can vote anywhere there. Any, you know, you have a number, you go, you can vote anywhere. That's the kind of ideas we need to move forward. Next slide. Uh, So, you know, citizens have to be, we have to have an assessment guide. What evidence do we have to prove that any of your elected officials have advocated for you? Ask yourself when it comes to developing sound policy and legislation for the black community. When was the last time your elected official drafted any policy or advocated for any legislation at the local, state, or federal level that has positively impacted you? Next slide. What we need. We need to not be racial deniers. We need to say race matters. We must focus on the root causes of black inequality, anti-black racism, and white supremacy, and the residual effects of which continue to derail black lives. Government must be accountable. We, government and the people who operate must be accountable for laws, policies, and practices, and uh, the black agenda should be a progressive agenda, and we should, next slide. I think that should be it. Next slide. That's it. Okay, thank you. No, thank you. Thank, uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Amity. Uh, uh, once again, I want to thank Southern University uh, of, at New Orleans and the Center for African and African American Studies and Dr. Clyde Robinson and your team and staff. Uh, we also uh, want to thank Dr. Ferdinand, how race and zip codes determine a person's health in Louisiana, Dr. Renard Sanders. Uh, race and racism led to the takeover of the New Orleans public school system. Cassandra Nika Morris, how race-based discriminatory housing practices and policies continue to adversely impact upon African Americans throughout New Orleans and Louisiana. And Dr. George Amity, uh, historical and contemporary racism in New Orleans, Louisiana politics. What should African Americans do to hold elected officials accountable? Guys, we're going to start with the free-flowing discussion. If there's a point, because I think so much, so much of it, the conversation. Uh, in your individual discipline, actually race uh, uh, with each other. I want to talk, start with Dr. Dr. Ferdinand. Uh, uh, race and zip codes. Uh, I remember Dr. the late Peter Dangerfield did a uh, zip code or an in-depth study on object poverty in the city of New Orleans. And he talked about how even during, quote unquote, good old days, uh, the quality of life wasn't impacted in those areas. How does that relate to health 
and where you live and racial discrimination around medicine in New Orleans? Dr. Ferdinand. Well, first, first of all, we have to recognize that to a large extent, race is not a scientific term at all mm -hmm. because patients will have different backgrounds as mixture of American Indian or Native American blood, European blood. So it's hard to say it's because of genetics. The marker that we're seeing now, for instance, in the COVID-19 mortality statistics is probably related to the social determinants of health, how those neighborhoods are. And then the color is just a manifestation of who's living in those neighborhoods. Even if you take poor neighborhoods, 1950s, 1960s, where you had more social integration, social integration, where people kind of lived together, they knew each other, they supported each other. I would think that regardless of the fact that those were black neighborhoods, to a large extent, they had less social disintegration than neighborhoods which are identified as black neighborhoods at this point. So health then becomes a manifestation of the social environment and race becomes what's called an epiphenomenon. It's something that's on top of those social determinants, but it's not the race itself. Now, there are conditions, sickle cell disease, certain types of kidney disease, where you can have genetic markers that increase your risk for that particular condition. But when we look at the, the, the overall life expectancy differences and the burden of diseases across populations and the burden of COVID-19, I think race then just becomes a marker for the social determinants of health and not the driver of the outcome. Uh, Dr. Ferdinand, thank you. Anjani Kamara, so when you talk about determinants, you did a study, and we, we talked about it years ago, that said that because of the lack of affordable housing, specifically in New Orleans in the region, we were missing out uh, on over half a billion dollars. Uh, so why would a community pass up on a half a billion dollars if you could have quality affordable housing? And how did we let that happen? So the answer simply is the insanity of white supremacy, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Um, and again, that's hard for us to accept that here in New Orleans, that in a Af majority African-American community, we are you know, playing by, playing along rules that talk about white supremacy, but we are. When you hear about people, and I'm sure a number of people have done it on this call and they've always been part of the conversation, uh, if you ever heard someone say that Section 8 renters don't care about their communities or you, and you nod your head sagely, that's anti-black racism. That's you talk, that's respectability politics run amok. Uh, and so what we have done is we have accepted this, the welfare queen stereotype as true and something that we don't want to be associated with. We're the good blacks and they are the bad blacks. And, um, it, and, it, and it continues with housing. We say Black Lives Matter, and extraordinarily, for the first time in a long time, the majority of Americans agree with that statement, except when it comes to housing. Um, all Black Lives Matter, unless you want to come stay by me, um, and you and you're a renter, and you're you live in you grew up in public housing, or you are currently in public housing, then your black butt can stay wherever you are, and that is how we have left a half a billion dollars annually on the table and continue to live with the consequences of this. Even with COVID, New Orleans, no, actually no state, no city in Louisiana got its fair share of its COVID, the COVID relief funding because no city has more than half a million people. And we were the only ones close. We were only the only ones close. So how do we go in 16 years from being the largest city in Louisiana, close to half a million people, to a city that in the last 20 years has the second worst declining population in the country. It is a failure, and everyone will say Katrina, we have billions of dollars to rebuild housing after Katrina. Where'd the money, we, I can tell you where the money went. I can tell you how it was mismanaged. I can tell you how it was weaponized against communities of color and, and, and like the lower ninth ward and how unfortunately African-American leaders and policymakers aided and abetted it with that and African-American community leaders aided and abetted with that, that, the, that, that evil and, and are still not, Dr. Amity is dead on. When we talk about looking at the policy decisions made by our elected officials from the city council up to uh, the, the, to Congress and from a legislative standpoint to what our executives from the governor to the mayor are asking for, 
it, it, it it's abominable. And the last four years, it re it really required that New Orleans and Louisiana protect itself. We could have. We could have protected ourselves against the Trump administration's disinterest in housing. And my worry is, is this current administration is very interested in housing. They are rolling out, um, you know, lots of funding finally for housing for COVID. If the locals can't manage it, or, or they are they are still refusing to address the issues. One thing that's happening simultaneous, simultaneously is our Louisiana Housing Corporation is finally being held to account for the fact that in July, they rolled out a $24 million rental assistance program and since July, they have spent only a little over $2 million, despite the fact that they got 40,000 applications. They have only helped 1,200 people. Wow, Andre, and, yeah. uh, no, powerful, powerful question. Uh, uh, Dr. Sanders, uh, we have some very esteemed people like uh, Dr. Delaney and many others that are listening to this Zoom. Uh, panel discussion. It's a good segue. Uh, uh, Andrew Nicomaris talked about the second worst uh, city when you talk about loss of depopulation or loss of population. But Dr. Sanders, they used that excuse uh, to take over the school system, didn't they? We had the worst public education system uh, in the country that was underserving uh, 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 black students, that was underserving the city. So why not? The next best thing was to take it over. Dr. Sanders. Well, I, I disagree with that. Um, I don't think that we had the worst school district in Louisiana, or even, even much less across the country. Um, in fact, um, prior to Hurricane Katrina, 80% of the schools met their annual growth product according to the Louisiana Accountability Plan. But, you know, I want to dig a little bit into that question because when you talk to people who are under the guise of school reform, every city in the country has the worst school district. If you talk to the people in Chicago, they got the worst. Right. You talk to the people in Washington, they got the worst, right? So we basically, they basically sell that to everybody and tell them, oh, they're the worst in the world and this, that, and the other. Now, did we have our problems? Yes. But was the problems that we had more related to poverty and the lack of support from the business community and the lack of and the policies that was being implemented from Baton Rouge, yes, okay? But if you compare that to now, if you took that premise and that question that you asked me and you compare that to now, why are we still the worst? Why do we have the worst ACT scores in the state of Louisiana? Why do we have the worst NAEP scores in the state of Louisiana? Why have we allowed a Louisiana Department of Education who say a kid is passing in eighth grade math when they get two out of 10 questions right. So this whole issue of how bad it was and this, that, and the other, that I don't buy into that. But the other thing is, is that when we get, you know, for what we have now, we have given up our public participation in the process. So we've given up democracy, right? And we have also led into the thing that, well, you know, you guys don't know how to manage yourself. We need to manage you. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? So, you know, it was not the worst, right? Did they have issues just like any other urban city? Yeah, they had issues just like any other white school district that had problems in Louisiana that is struggling with poverty and those kinds of things. So is this better now than it was before? By no means. Uh Dr. Amity, from Dr. Ferdinand's presentation to what we just heard from Dr. Uh, Sanders, uh, I, I remember uh, in the Kennedy School and Executive Program, uh, uh, Ron da Dr. Ron David uh, was my instructor on public policy in medicine, Dr. Ferdinand, when he talked about how major public policy around black folk and their lives were dictated from myth versus the realities of medicine. But they were turned into policies that started mass, mass incarceration. They were turned into policies that predicted that crack babies would ruin the world when there was no science that was any different from a mother who smoked too many cigarettes or drank too many beers. Do Dr. Amity, we just heard from uh, Andrew Nicomars talk about the lack of public policy to take advantage of a half a billion dollar opportunity. And of course, Dr. Sanders saying myth versus public realities to take over a system 
uh, that was performing just as good as well as any other in the country. Talk about the use or the lack thereof and, how, and the importance of public policy when making policy decisions about our lives in each of those areas. Well, you know, that, that's a very good question. Uh, my response is that, uh, you know, there's a, a way to make pop public policy, you know, the kind of stuff we're doing now, we're analyzing, analyzing data, looking at need and the like, but some kind of way our policies are being made in another way. Because I, my, my, my feeling is that there are other agendas on the table. And it's those other agendas are not the agendas that are beneficial to African Americans. Uh, you know, I, I use an analogy that uh, uh, Milana Karinga used in talking about slavery. He said, well, no, you've got three groups. you got the uh, perpetuators, you have the collaborators, and you have the victims. And so among African Americans, we have too many collaborators. You know, and so I think that that we have to have more pushback from our leadership on on on, on and more input on this pol on policies that are beneficial uh, to our community. And I don't think that's happening now. I'll give you a perfect example. Not, my my presentation covered both, you know, the impact of incarceration mm -hmm. and also representation by way of redistricting. We have heard nothing, nothing from our leaders about redistricting at all. Other states have had five, six, seven, eight town hall meetings all across uh, the, their state. We haven't heard anything. Do you know of any anything? And this thing, it's coming up right now. Only so on the listen. only on the Good Morning Show with you. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, but that's a policy area that we need to be involved in. Great it's going to be critical to all, to all the other areas, Great to point. the health uh, aspect, to the housing aspect, to the education aspect. And we have heard nothing. Great point. It's not even on the radar. Uh, uh, Andrea Kamara, I want to start with you with this one. Uh, Jefferson Parish during this pandemic. Uh, have noticed that they, ha they have a windfall. I think their budget has increased by almost $200 million while the city of New Orleans has decreased during the same pandemic. We also know, uh, Ms. Morris, that because of New Orleans public policies or lack thereof, we've created an affordable housing market, especially for young executives and those up in, in mobile, in Jefferson Parish and in the region. Talk about the irony of that it, when, when it's right next to the city with the largest African-American population in the state. So, and to be clear, Jefferson Parish does have an affordable housing crisis right. as well. It's just not as extreme as New Orleans. And it, it, this comes to the root of how we think about our real estate market, right? As opposed to first measuring it, whether or not we are adequately doing what it's supposed to do, which is housing everyone. And then looking at um, when you talk about who, when you look at capital, capitalism and who's making money off of it, you know, how good are those investments or are you pay, playing the long game of hot potato, right? Um, you're going to keep selling properties, hoping that you can get rid of it before it, the market crashes. And the market always corrects itself. It always crashes. But you're right, OT, there is, there is a, there's a sharp irony to the fact that there's so many people who live in Jefferson Parish and, and surrounding parishes. Uh, St. Tammany, actually, in that same study that I'm talking about, the, state, the, par the city that grew the most right. was St. Tammany Parish in the last 20 years, right. while New Orleans, Orleans Parish, had the most population loss. And so, again, you're talking about the bedroom communities where a, a good number of those who, who live there work in New Orleans, and are what are high paying jobs in the region and they take those jobs back out to to the suburbs and they invest in the businesses out there they, they put their kids in the school system um but this is also you know something that new orleans did even pre-katrina right that cycle of of making ourselves attractive to young professionals sometimes white sometimes african-americans to have to come and play and have fun in new orleans they would get married, and then when they started looking at the, the, the challenges in our school system, 
and the crime issues. They'd go, well, I can get more. I can get a much bigger house right. with a yard and other things in the in, in the suburbs, and my school, and I won't have to pay to put my kids in private school. So they make the decision to to no longer no, New Orleans is not the place where they want to be all the time. Now they're going to come in and they want to make sure everything stays the same, so they can come and get a hotel room for Mardi Gras and and stay downtown, and they can come down and the kids can come down. Um, we have got to end this usury, this par- this parasitic relationship we have with too many of our neighbors. Hey, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ferdinand. First of all, thank you for your leading voice uh, throughout this country right now on the vaccine uh, and the disparity in the relationship for African Americans. Uh, those same zip codes uh, that play out in terms of uh, determinants, comorbidity, health disparity, those same zip codes are playing out right now uh, when you talk about COVID-19, the coronavirus, and, uh, and access to the vaccine. Please make the connection and talk about how, why, why it still exists and, in term, and what type of public policy do we need to begin to address those discrepancies and those disparities. Thank you very much. First, let me address the problem. Uh, our governor at least has made the effort to have a COVID-19 health equity task force in which he attempts to address some of the structural racism which has infected health care just as it has politics, just as it has housing. So health care is part of that problem. It probably goes back as far as the free market in the thing called chattel slavery, where you could get someone to pick cotton or cut cane and pay them pennies for their work by just giving them some discarded animal parts and whatever food they could harvest from the fields. Move fast forward to 2021, the pandemic hits, you have an increase in death and disability and communities of color, again, not driven by genetics, but by the fact that people were cashiers, grocery clerks, transit operators, ward clerks in the hospital, and they were being exposed without any protective equipment or without any means for them to protect themselves. Now the problem becomes complicated. We have vaccines and I have looked at the data I don't think it's a Tuskegee experiment. I think the vaccine indeed can be life-saving, protecting against severe COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and death. But now that we have the vaccines, those communities, which I've just described as being hardest hit, are getting vaccinated less. And the easy way to get out of it is say, well, that's because of vaccine hesitancy and mistrust in the system. And clearly that's part of it. But a bigger part appears to be just the structural way in which the vaccines were delivered in various locations or not delivered. And I'll give you some quick examples. Mm -hmm. We look at maps of vaccine administration sites. And then you look at the same maps that I showed you about those green areas that were highest for the social vulnerability index, which goes directly to housing and unemployment, et cetera. You have less vaccination sites in those dark green areas that I showed you than along Veterans Boulevard from the shopping mall to the airport. You can just walk up and down there and find a place to get vaccinated without any hesitancy, whereas in New Orleans, you have to kind of search for it. The other problem that's really strange is that if you look at New Orleans East Hospital, which is a community hospital, your tax dollars at work, you even look at some of the community centers, whites from other areas will drive in to areas where they never sought for health care and get on the vaccination list. In public reported data, this has been reproduced in New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, where even in inner city community centers, federally qualified health centers, people with means will sign up and drive in, don't seek health care, but they'll get the vaccine. So what we're trying to do now is to make sure that we have those structural inequalities related to vaccine delivery addressed making sure that we have more sites 
that are located in the areas that had the highest areas of hospitalization and mortality. But that ain't the way it is right now. Right now, although blacks, Hispanics, other people of color have more hospitalization than death, they're getting less vaccinated. And I don't think it's just because of hesitancy. We know hesitancy was a problem, especially on the front end. But right now, I think it's structural how we have things set up. Thank you, Dr. Fernand. Uh, Dr. Sanders, uh, there was a time when we heard from experts that uh, community-based schools uh, were important. <laughs> there was a time when we heard from Gladwell and many others that a cultural-based foundation for education was important. Uh, there was a time we heard that smaller class sizes uh, were important. Why aren't those things important anymore, Dr. Sanders? Well, because there's, there's another agenda on the table. And the things that you mentioned earlier was doing the things that the research had defined as best practices and the things that we need to be doing in communities to create good schools and good learning environments for kids. But this agenda here, you know, it, it, it is not to improve academic achievement. The, this scam that, we, that they're doing with charter schools, not just here, but across the country and that they sell in New Orleans at, has more to do with um, taking over budgets, making our schools profitable, and offering only ed educational services to a small group of students. So neighborhoods are not any important. Matter of fact, if you listen to the folks that's running the school district now, they'll tell you experience and teacher certification and training is not, is not important, right? So there's a whole different agenda uh, as it relates to now. And you know, one of the criticisms that I and others have with this present school district is, is that they don't do best practices, right? So we're gonna take, for instance, we're gonna create a school, we're gonna give it to somebody, give, it, give this charter license to somebody who's never been an educator. We're gonna allow them to hire people who have never taught before in their life, right? We're not gonna promote any of the best practices that is tried and proven that says it, which, which we should be doing. And we give them schools here in New Orleans. And these charter schools are opening and closing. I mean, right, you know, right in front of our faces. It doesn't matter. So in answer to your question, OT, it's a different agenda. This is not about academic achievement. This is not about improving kids' ability to participate um, in the world, like uh, politically and economically. This is about control of resources, which kids go to which schools, and also keeping us in a suburban position of being um, uh, at the bottom of the economic and social pillars in this community. Dr. George Amity, which kids go to which schools? Uh, who do we value in terms of medicine and affordable housing? Uh, which leaders lead certain communities, whether they're black, white, Hispanic, male, uh, fe or, fe or female? Uh, the role of, the, of uh, black elected officials and how we hold them accountable. And something was said earlier, I think, in terms of black, and I, and I wrote down in the comment, black leadership uh, adopting the rules of white supremacy and guidelines, even though they think they have platforms to help black people. Explain that, and how do we hold uh, uh, black elected leadership accountable, let alone political leadership, period? Dr. Amity. Well, I think uh, this kind of forum is a start, mm -hmm. but you know, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I put some of the blame on the, uh, the, the elected officials, but some of it, you know, I, I got to go back to the voters because the voters, in my opinion, uh, you know, they have to have a little better uh, sophistication in who we choose as our elected officials. Uh, you know, I, I, I never forget I was uh, hired to engage in a study and this was a study on uh, state legislature, uh, and looking at the voting records of, of uh, state legislatures. And uh, when we looked at it, we looked at them from the standpoint of not only majority districts, we also looked at a standpoint with even districts where uh, black, where, where representatives had at least 25% or more of black population or black voters in their district. 
And so when we publish this uh, piece, it actually uh, incited all of the activists in the city and they went around the city uh, going to these folks' offices, picketing their offices and telling them, making them sign a saying that you will never compromise the black community again. The point I'm making is that sometimes we just don't know what's going on. And, and, and the best piece is really transparency. And sometimes, you know, we just don't know to what extent our, not all of our leaders, but some of our leaders are selling us out. And so that, if we, that needs to be more transparent about who's what. I'll give you an, another example with the school system. Uh, Morris Holmes came in with, you know, as superintendent, and I think the scores were this, this uh, decent, and there was a, a, at least a balanced budget. But some kind of way or another, we wind, everybody thought we need more more discipline with our kids. So we came in with uh, the general, the colonel, that was the next move. And then all of a sudden, uh, budgets start getting unbalanced, scores started declining. And so they said, well, no, we don't need him. We need a model, another ethnic group. And boy, money started going out of the back door of the, of the school system like it never was before. So here we had a, a, a real black leader in place who actually had some good markets. He wasn't from New Orleans, right. but some kind of way, somebody convinced us we needed something else. And so I'm saying that sometimes to me, it's transparency, it's awareness, it's knowing what's going on and knowing who's doing what and, being a, and making them accountable by putting pressure on them and also not only putting pressure on them, but also by unelecting them or not electing them in the beginning. Uh, th those listening, uh, Dr. Robinson, the season is saying why our political segment every month with Dr. Clark and Dr. Amity is one of the most uh, sought after and listened to Dr. Uh, Dr. Amity uncut, uh, unleashed, <laughs> and uh, definitely not contained. Uh, the first question, uh, Dr. Ferdinand, from our audience is, uh, Charles from Suno is for Dr. Ferdinand. Ferdinand. He says, we know that zip codes play a very important role in the health and life expectancy for black people, but could you give us some solutions uh, today so we can begin to deal with it now? Dr. Ferdinand. Yeah, the solutions are very difficult. I think we need universal insurance. Everyone should have the ability to pay for basic health care without going into debt. We should have identifiable sources of primary care. You should be able to get your care easily accessible without difficulty. And you should have an insurance that will pay you for appropriate testing and referral to specialists. When you look at analyses, for instance, of those areas that did not expand Medicaid, did not accept the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, mm -hmm. they actually have the worst outcomes. And one of the baffling components of structural racism where the people in business and the free market keeps their foot on the neck of black people in order to have cheap or free labor or a minimum wage that's below a living wage is that white folks will support, poorer white folks will support politicians who have those type of policies and they need Medicaid and Affordable Care Act too. So I, I never could figure that one out. <laughs> Other than just right. you know being happy that they ain't black, I could never figure out why disadvantaged people who self-identify as white will support politicians who are working against their own health care. So universal health care, identifiable sources of primary care, the ability to get medications and testing without difficulty. The housing part is a very big part of it. We know that COVID loves to get into a household and and go throughout the household. If you have multi-generational homes, which are more common than people of color, then if grandma or auntie is in the house with the kid, the child may not be sick, may be asymptomatic and affect the older person. And again, in terms of just working, if a person has a job, which is they now call essential worker, which is trying to make it sound really nice, but if they have a job where they're exposed to the public, they need to have protective uh, devices available, glasses, shields, et cetera, because they're the persons who are getting affected 
the words. Let me make one more comment. It's only going to take 30 seconds. Okay. It's somewhat humorous, but it's true. I used to bust tables at one of the big hotels downtown when I was a kid. And the guys used to stuff steaks down their pants and, and take soft drinks and put them in their pants and, and, and sneak out with them. And I told one of my friends, man, you know, it's great, man. They're getting over. They're taking steaks. They're taking soft drinks from this joint. And he said, they know you're taking that. <laughs> they said, it's minimum wage and all you can steal. They'd rather give you that than sick leave, health insurance, unemployment insurance. So, yeah, you can, you can take some raw steaks and soft drinks. They let you do that. That's part of the gig. Well, I, I had heard that they used to stock extra so that you could steal extra. It's amazing. Uh, amazing. Uh, the, the next question is for doc, from CCR to Dr. Amity. Will African Americans ever be able to hold elected officials accountable? And why is that important, given that elected officials do what they want anyway? Well, uh, I, I, think, I think the mechanisms are in place. Uh, I, you know, and, and to, the answer to me is they can be held up accountable. The question, the question is, will we hold them accountable? And I, I think, uh, you know, we have to get better at that. There are a lot of uh, efforts that are going on nationally, uh, organizations uh, that are, I, a lot of them have, haven't developed uh, in the state of Louisiana, in New Orleans, but there are a lot of various organizations. Some of them I had in my presentation. I took it out because I didn't want it to be so long. But there are, uh, uh, you know, have developing black PACs, PACs, political action committees. Uh, they're developing organizations to raise funds for organizing and mobilizing voters uh, for uh, that will elect candidates that have uh, a, a more progressive black agenda. Uh, there, you know, so uh, I'm optimistic about some of the things that are going, that I've seen that are going on uh, in other states, uh, and I'm optimistic that some of those things will eventually come to New Orleans. Uh, our next question is for uh, 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 Ms. Morris and Dr. Sanders. It's from uh, Nola Fly Girl. Uh, I like that name. Uh, Ms. Morris and Dr. Sanders. How does housing impact upon education? Great question, Flagra. So yeah, it's a great question. And it's one thing that we like to talk about a lot. It's really obvious now with COVID because so many kids have to be educated at home. But before and hopefully when we're done with COVID, housing is the, the foundation, right? You do homework. You have, if you can, you cannot do well in school if you do not have a safe, solid home. And what we like to focus on is, um, you know, the, the parental issues, like the guardianship issues, what's going on in their home life, thinking about their parents. But we very rarely think about whether or not that child has a safe, decent, safe place to call home and why they don't have those things. Another instance where we're leaving money on the table, uh, when we've been talking about the challenges with dealing with this new school system, there is money via the McKinney-Vento McKinney Act that would allow our school systems to help and support kids who are homeless. We can't get our arms around what that number is because the schools aren't asking about it. You know, in addition to some of the creaming that's going on, they don't want to know why some of these children are, children are being challenged because then you might have to do something about it. Uh, Dr. Sanders, your take. Um, I want to congratulate the center for putting this panel together. But I think one of the things that listening audience needs to understand is, is that these different topics that we're talking about are intertwined with each other, right? They're more connected than they are separate, even though we are, you know, we have expertise in, in certain fields and those kinds of Agreed. things, right? But the whole issue of poverty and how poverty affects children, uh, even in a regular environment, to do well in school. How poverty affects the whole housing issue. How poverty affects the whole medical issue and those kinds of things, right? So, you know, I think that the agenda here in New Orleans to build this 21st century urban, urban model is to double down um, you know, and squeeze black people more and more and more, make them poorer than ever before, 
and put us back in a position where we have no voice, we have no power, and those kinds of things, right? So, you know, education is so closely related to housing, as Ms. Morris has said, and education is so closely related to what Keith has talked about and George has talked about, and we all need each other. But with poverty brings certain kinds of challenges in each one of these arenas that make that we have to do things a little bit differently, and we don't want to blame it on poverty. We want to blame it on black people. Then th 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 that's a perfect segue. We're going to stay with you, for Dr. Sanders. It's amazing how spiritually ordained this conversation is. CJ from NOLA says, uh, Dr. Sanders, how does the black community in NOLA suffer from the takeover? Give us some examples and why. Well, you suffer from the takeover, number one, is because our students are doing very, very poorly. And you cannot believe that hype that's coming out of the Louisiana Department of Education where um, they're telling you that we're doing, you know, good on state tests, but when a national test tell us something totally right. different. The black community is also suffering because we're doing a mass migration every day, busing kids across the city, putting them in harm's way at bus stops at 4.30, 5.30 in the morning to go to school across town instead of going to school around the corner. Um, it's just endless kinds of things. We also have seen in this post-Katrina era the resurrection of civil rights issues that we long since had solved. So now in Louisiana and New Orleans, and not just in New Orleans, but also if you go to North Louisiana, you can very well take public money and create an all-white school. You could very well take public money and not hire any teachers and put money in the pocket, right? So, Public education is our most important public service with our most important, important resource. And for us to continue down this path, and that's hurting us, our future, hurting our children, putting, just putting parents and, and, and families in such at-risk situation is extreme. You know, we can't move as a city when 80% of the population is African-American and we're not doing the right things to educate those kids and to put them in a position to reach their full potential. Uh, well, let's stick with uh, poverty and its impact. Uh, Ms. Sandra from Baton Rouge, Dr. Ferdinand. Her question is, is there a difference in uh, health of elite uh, middle-class blacks compared with poor blacks? And the follow-up is, what, is the, what are the differences in the health and health expectancy? for, for uh, middle-class and upper-class blacks uh, and middle-class whites? Yeah, there's still a disparity um, even when you look across social demographics. So it's not simply income that predicts it. For instance, there was one study that looked at doctors who graduated from Mahari, which is an historical black medical college in Nashville, Tennessee, and compared them to doctors who graduated from Johns Hopkins, which is a white institution, one of the leading institutions in Baltimore. And then they looked at the doctors over 10, 20, 30 years. The black doctors died earlier, had more heart attacks, had more strokes. Why is that? Well, first of all, many black doctors have to struggle because much of their income comes from Medicaid, Medicare, where they may not be reimbursed the same. They don't get the gravy patients who are paying, quote, the best insurances over cash. Secondly, even within the healthcare delivery system, there's discrimination against some black doctors, whereas they don't get the same privileges or access to the same institutions. And then finally, just because you've been able to educate yourself and get a medical degree and become a practicing black physician, doesn't mean that you didn't have exposure to the 20 and 30, 40 years of, of racism, structural racism, or the exposure to cultural habits which were adverse that are different perhaps from your white colleague. So money is the problem. The social demographics clearly affect outcomes, but it can cut across those lines a little bit more uh, seditiously than you would think. Let me give you one more example. Yeah. Again, my 30 seconds, but yeah. it's an important example. Absolutely. We had a health fair at Audubon Zoo after Katrina when people were coming back 
And I was there and we were serving people and we were trying to get their prescription medicine and giving them free blood tests and checking the blood sugar and checking the blood pressure. Had hundreds of people lined up. Somebody told me, man, they got teachers out there in the line. I said, what? And I went out to the line and I saw some middle class, ostensibly middle class, older black women who were teachers who were trying to access their prescriptions and get free testing because they didn't have insurance because Orleans Parish had summarily dismissed them as employed persons with insurance tied to their employment. It's one of the great scandals in the history of New Orleans. Somehow it got missed by the media. It's been buried by time. But the point being, just because we're educated, we have a bachelor's degree or an MD or even a jurisprudence degree, even a black attorney is struggling, doesn't mean that we have the same level of comfort, psychological or even economic comfort, despite that education. So that, that's a, a real example. That's probably the harshest example where just having, quote, black middle class status doesn't protect you from some of the ravages of structural racism. Uh, Dr. Amity, uh, we've heard a lot in all of these different sectors that are important. I agree with Dr. Sanders that this really could just be one discussion wrapped into uh, one topic about where black people are uh, and poor people are, specifically black people are here uh, in America. Donna Brazil was a guest uh, over a year ago on the Good Morning Show, uh, where you contribute. And I never forget the conversation we have with her. She says a lot of people look at her in terms of who's elected, but we forget the importance of uh, the conversation or the accountability about not just who's elected, but what are their policies while they're elected. The myth versus reality, Section 3 versus vet best faith effort, uh, versus political platforms, versus what the law says you can actually do. How do we get people to begin to understand that a political platform, political speeches are one thing. Democratic Party, Republican Party is another thing. But changing, adopting, and strengthening public policy actually affects everything we're talking about now. Dr. Amity. That, that's a very good question uh, because, you know, I, I know a lot of my comments is emphasized really about what uh, black leadership is doing. And I understand that there's systemic racism. Uh, and even though we make choices as leaders, uh, there are a lot of things that we're, we're limited. Uh, but let me just say this. I'm not a, a, a you know, a political science determinist. <laughs> you know, I, do, I do understand that uh, power is not just political power. You know, uh, there's, there's the power of not just elected officials, there's the power of uh, appointed officials. So you can have people elected in office and then City Hall through his civil service uh, piece can have folk who are blocking everything going on. Uh, you also, uh, there's also economic power, you know? And so economic power, uh, when you have strong black businesses and people with wealth, who can undergird and support political candidates that then you have, you, you may get different results. Uh, then, but then there's, you know, thinking and awareness and education. So I guess the point that I'm making is that, uh, you know, all of these arenas interact with one another. Uh, I, you know, I, my focus is on uh, us getting the black elected officials uh, to do their part, but they, them doing it by themselves won't make a change. Why well, I am hopeful as well, because I teach at a university. I come in contact with young people, and our young people, they don't think the same way that we think or the way we thought when we were that age. And so consequently, I believe that over time, there's going to be a different paradigm. Uh, but, you know, it, the, the political is only one aspect of it. There, you know, I think there's some eight or nine different bases of power. Coalitions okay. is another, it's very important. Uh, you know, with the, you know, we have to be, but we have to be able to go into coalitions with people where there's a compromise. Thank you. But at least we're getting something. 
you know, I mean, I understand politics is, is you know, the art of compromise, but we have people that are in elected office who are just concerned about their particular positions or their paychecks mm -hmm. or what they're getting, their status, and be damned everybody else. That has to change. Thank you. Uh Anthony Kamaris, we want you to be an affordable housing determinant right now. Uh, we're familiar with major tourism destinations around the world and around the country right now uh, where working class people used to live. Uh, but now many of them live in camps, so they have to be bussed up and down the mountain or around the path to get to where they work. The future of affordable housing in the metropolitan region. Ms. Morris. So unless we make a dramatic and very deliberate turn, the future of housing in New Orleans is very bleak. Uh, when you look at where we are right now, we shouldn't have an affordable housing crisis right now. 20% of occupiable homes sit empty right now. This is a city built for 650,000 people and it doesn't have 400,000 people living here right now. So this is artificial, it is man-made, and it has to be unmade. And unless we get our elected officials to really recognize this and acknowledge the challenge, this, the, the situation is very bleak. This will only get worse. We keep getting, I've been likening the last years to us getting versions of the plagues of Egypt. Um, first COVID and these, the, the battering rams of these, these hurricanes and now this polar vortex. All of these demand housing, and we still don't do it. We are still letting our elected officials and our policymakers squander resources and play these games. So if we do not do something, this is, this is not going to be good. You just laid it out, and we're already doing some of that. About 50,000 workers in New Orleans who, do, who make less than minimum wage, who make minimum wage, so they're not these are not workers who are taking their resources out of the city and, and investing in suburban living. About 50,000 low wage workers don't live here right now, can't afford to live here right now. And they are living in the, the neighboring parishes, struggling there as well, but it's not as, as severe of a struggle as it would be, it's, it's impossible for them to be here. And so we're already doing that where they are coming in by hook or by crook, um, because a transit system doesn't so, so certainly doesn't really support them getting in and out easily. They're getting rides. It means that they're in their um, their jobs insecure because they're not consistently showing up to work. And uh, and again, with the way COVID has devastated the tr the hospitality industry, a lot of those workers won't be getting those jobs back uh, for quite some time. It's going to take New Orleans years to rebuild our tourism economy. We have a really excellent marker. Mm -hmm. I believe last year's Mardi Gras was one of the biggest ever. Yes. So that's, we've got a good starting point where we're trying to get back to, but why? Why, are, why would we want to go back to some of that? Why not, do, why not work for better? Every year we have something before the pandemic. It was the biggest and best and made the most money ever, but the people never got the money from the biggest, best, and most money ever. Ms. Morris, quickly. From uh, Dr. Claude Robinson here at the center, which political party addresses the housing dilemma best? Uh, n neither. <laughs> uh, they're, both, they're, both, they're both bad in different ways. Uh, Republicans can, uh, yeah. no, seriously, Republicans can uh, be actually helpful because they are more interested in the, the commoditization of housing. So they tend to let the money flow to help their developer friends build and subsidize housing and make money. So you get, you get policies that will at least create more housing opportunities. Under Democrats, particularly white Democrats, there is a desire to show white uh, conservatives that they can be tough on black people by reforming housing and ignoring housing policies. So neither party is particularly good uh, on when it comes to housing policy. Dr. Sanders, one of uh, someone who's listening uh, asked me to ask you uh, before Dr. Ferdinand closes us out with the health question. Uh, they want you to be uh, uh, education Nostradamus right now. Uh, what is public e education uh, today and with, with charters and vouchers and uh, private and, and public? And based on what we're doing with public education today, uh, 
what should we look forward to for public education and access to quality public education in the future? Dr. Sanders. Well, I think that there's, um, there's a lot of things wrong with it. You know, for the sake of this particular panel mm -hmm. and for urban communities across the country, um, New Orleans is the model for basically removing the democracy, taking the public out of public education, and giving schools, poor communities, poor quality environments, learning environments. And New Orleans is the model for that. So um, for African-American communities, we have to insist upon direct involvement, public participation, not none of these charters that, that, that um, have all these self-appointed boards with a parent and doing the things that's the best practices and ensuring that which goes back to what George talked about. But across this country, generally, we've got to get away from this whole issue of determining whether or not a kid can go to the next grade because of a standardized test. We've got to look at things much differently. We have to do things that some of the other countries are doing in terms of teaching, in terms of, of, of moving kids along, mm -hmm. where they de-emphasize standardized tests and put more on exploration and learning and, 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 and experiences and those kinds of things. Um, and that's from a, a, you know, yeah. a, across the country. But our issue here, I think, has to do with whether or not we're going to survive as a people, as African Americans, and this plague that's being brought up by the Broad Foundation, the Walton Foundation, uh, Netflix guy, you know, they're, they're going to kill African American communities. Uh, that's a great segue to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ferdinand. Um, Dr. Ferdinand, the next point that somebody made for me to ask you is that if we can't be well, we can't be anything. We know that the health disparities, the experiments on African-American and poor communities have existed for uh, centuries, uh, decades, if not centuries. What should we be doing? And where does African-American wellness start? And how should we be educating our people around chronic illnesses and around health disparities? Dr. Ferdinand. And the last part they said was, should you take the shot? <laughs> let me do, let me do the, the, the last one first. Uh, you know, I stayed up at night trying to figure out what was going on with this COVID-19 deal. And I was staring at the ceiling. I couldn't figure out how we were going to get out of this. When the vaccines became available, I was a skeptic just like anyone else. The, the warp speed concept that somehow things were pushed ahead. But when you look at the science, those platforms on which the vaccines were built were already there. They just needed to have the genetic information on the coronavirus in order to formulate the vaccines. And indeed, of the two vaccines that were available, one was with my colleagues at NIH, many of whom I know personally, one of whom is an African-American woman, Kisby Corbett. The other was with Pfizer-BioNTech. Pfizer is an American company. BioNTech is a Germany company company, but it was actually Turkish immigrants who were the lead scientists there. These were multicultural, diverse people who put these platforms together. And when the phase three data, which is the published data, became available, it's pretty obvious that other than those people who were having the severe allergic reactions and some very isolated incidents, the vaccines are really safe and effective. We now have had 50 million people who've had at least one shot. And if you think clearly about this, if there was something horrible that these vaccines were causing, we would know it. It wouldn't be an isolated Facebook post or something that you heard on the tweet. It would be a very evident problem with the vaccines, and we just don't see it. I have been vaccinated. I recommend that my extended family get vaccinated. I recommend that my patients, who I'm going to go back to clinic today, uh, get vaccination. Thank you. We need to use the tools of science to help ourselves as best as we can. First question. What was the first question? Uh, th th given the disparities today. Uh, the disparities. The, 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 disparities the, road, the road to wellness for African Americans, yeah. period. If we can't be well, we can't be anything. Where should we, that road to wellness have, start? We're going to have to push, we're going to have to push politicians to expand universal health care, expand and support the affordable care, make Medicaid uh, more readily accessible, make the Medicare providers 
who get a lump of sum from the federal government and then hold on to every penny they can and deny as much as they can in terms of care, make those particular processes more transparent. And then we as a community have to recognize that some of our cultural identity, which has been built into perhaps some adverse health habits, we overcome some of those in terms of smoking, lack of exercise, a lot of uh, fried foods, animal fats, et cetera. We have to try to embrace different ways in which we can maintain the taste and the culture, but do a little bit better, and then educate ourselves about health and go to .edus, mm -hmm. .orgs, or .gov, and stop getting stuff off of Facebook <laughs> that your cousin from Los Angeles posted or reading some tweet or some Instagram on this, that, and the other. Try to get the basis for our decision based on the best science available and not allow the Russians and other people who are feeding the black community adverse views in terms of our own empowerment. They want us to kill ourselves. And I don't say that lightly because the Russian bots also send us the vaccine stuff like they do all the other stuff they send us. And try to inform ourselves and be active components in that. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. I have to get back to work. Thank you. I appreciate Dr. Williams, Southern University, the moderator of Mr. Thomas, my other colleagues, Dr. Saunders, Dr. Amity, Ms. Harris, all of you, all the things you said. Thank you for this opportunity. And hopefully we can continue to push back from people who want to put us back in the field. And I think that's a great segue to the closing. Uh, when you talk about having the best science and the best information, uh, to Southern University family and the Center for African and African American Studies and Dr. Clyde Robinson. Uh, thank you so much uh, for gathering these, these experts from Dr. Ferdinand to Dr. Amity, Dr. Sanders, and uh, Andronika Morris. Thank you so much uh, for being the beacon of light for fighting for housing. Is, housing should be a right, a moral right, and a civic right for all who live here. Dr. Sanders, if our kids can't learn, we take, can't take advantage of the greatest gift that God gives us. And uh, Dr. Amity, just like Donna Brazil said, it's okay to focus on parties and personalities, but if their policies don't do, don't do you any good, uh, then those policies need to be changed like those elected officials. Dr. Robinson, thank you and the Southern family for allowing me to facilitate and moderate this other panel. If there's any closing remarks from you, Dr. Clyde Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Brother O.T. Uh, again, thank the panelists for your dynamic contribution. Brother O.T., you are the voice of the black community uh, without question. Uh, we'd like to thank the audience for participating in this very important event. Do know that the Center for African and African American Studies at SUNO is dedicated to bringing to our campus our campus community and the community at large issues that impact upon African American New Orleanians, African Americans in general, and people throughout the world. I'd like to um, also thank uh, Dr. James uh, um, Ammons, our chancellor, Dr. Brenda Jackson, the vice chancellor for research and strategic initiatives, and of course, the executive director for Title III programming, uh, uh, Dean uh, Evelyn Harrell, who is the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Doug Marshall, who is the departmental chair. I'd like to, to thank, in particular, um, Sister Linda Hill, Sister Darlene Holmes, who are members of the Center for African and African American Studies and who uh, both do dynamic work. And of course, I'd like to thank Dr. Mike Meehan and Brother Chauncey Kamen for their undeniably important technical assistance. Uh, please reference the YouTube channel that um, wherein we host many of our programs. We have two programs running at this moment uh, that uh, continue to show the commitment of CAS. And um, they are our Kwanzaa program, which is still being shown, featuring Dr. Ron Daniels, who's discussing the significance of reparations. And of course, uh, Dr. Uh, State Representative 
um, Brother Jordan from Baton Rouge, who is discussing House Bill 51, which addresses qualified immunity, uh, which um, is impacting upon the country at this moment. And so again, we are in the process of pursuing very important topics and issues impacting upon the African American community. Also remember that this is part two of our I Can't Breathe discussions of race, racism, and lasting change in New Orleans and throughout Louisiana. This brings an end to that discussion, at least using this platform. Please join us in March as we will bring to you a vibrant discussion about the role uh, African American women have played and are playing in the city of New Orleans, state of Louisiana, and throughout the United States. In particular, we will be examining the life and times of Sister Danielle Metz. Again, Asante Sana and peace and power.